Welcome to Rob Roseman of WTF Divorce. Rob is the very famous former Las Vegas poker pro. He's a divorce dad to three kids who are ages 10, 8, and 5. And as I mentioned, he is the founder of WTF Divorce. Thanks for being here, Rob. Thank you, Tracy. Excited to be here. Well, first, before we get started, I would love for you to tell me about WTF Divorce and what that platform is all about. Yeah, uh, I'm divorced now about three years, right when the pandemic hit. That's when we made the terrible decision to jump right into divorce. Um, my head was spinning. I think uh, as I talked to a lot of people, a lot of the struggle of divorce happens after you sign the papers. Once you're like, have to move out and figure out your finances and co-parenting. And I was just struggling with that as a, especially as a divorced dad, I couldn't really find anybody that I could relate to until I stumbled on Instagram. Like most guys, I found myself looking at dating content. Somehow that led me into the divorce world. And I just found it really helpful for me to find other people that were going through what I was going through. And I just thought, more people should have access to this, all these incredible coaches and experts and professionals. What if I could make it easier for other people, guys especially, to access this stuff? So I kind of just whipped up a little experiment, started a podcast where I was interviewing other people going through it and try to inject some humor and some levity to it. That's a big part of what we do. And like, about a year later, we're, we're blowing up and it's like been really fun, really gratifying. I get messages every day from people saying how much the page helps them and makes them feel less alone. So WTF divorce, it's a feeling that we all are going through and like it's, it's been cool to, to give back to the community. Well, as I am around the divorce community, I see that there are so many resources that really speak to women in particular. And as much as we all try to be inclusive, um, there just seems to be more resources for women. So as a man going through divorce, what was your experience with that? Yes, uh, rough for sure. I think in general, guys do not talk about their feelings. We didn't talk about our marriages. We're not really talking about our divorces. Um, so it was very isolating. And But I did find other guys that were speaking about it, being vulnerable. And I said, wow, this is, there's gotta be other people like me thinking this. So how can we get that word out to other guys? I quickly learned like everybody else does. The audience is probably 75 to 80% women. And, uh, my girlfriend at the time said, I want to hear this stuff too. So like, why don't you make it for everybody? So I'd say 90% of it, uh, touches, you know, it's good for both men and women, but I think having like a guy's point of view, and, you know, talking about a few different topics is a little more relatable to guys that would probably not, you know, listen to, you know, a lot of these women divorce coaches that are giving out great info. They, they can't relate to it. So hearing from another guy, I think, can be helpful. Yeah, I think that is really a, a distinct advantage that you have in the space is you can speak to guy to guy about what you've been through, about what the experience was like. So what do you see? What elements of WTF divorce do people seem to be drawn to the most? I know you've got, you know, you've got a great Instagram presence. You do a lot of stories there. You've got the website, you've got the podcast, but what are you seeing that people are accessing the most and really connecting with the most? Well, for me, it was, it's this feeling of nobody gets what I'm going through and my family doesn't get it. They say, Oh, you'll meet somebody or, Oh, we didn't like her anyways. Like that doesn't really help me. My married friends do not get it. Uh, nobody really gets it unless you've been through a divorce and like that kind of gap. I was like, how can we fill that? I saw a friend of mine on Instagram would share like confessions, like very anonymous confessions that usually were kind of, uh, R rated, but like incredibly addictive. And like people just love to share anonymously, anonymously these stories. I thought, why not, you know, give that a shot. And those kind of exploded where people, even if they weren't able to share their own thing, they could see somebody say, uh, I can't stand my co-parent. I secretly love when my kids aren't with me. I hope my ex was dead. 
these kind of things. And they would message me like raising their hand. Oh my God, that's what I'm going through. And I think that's that feeling of like, you're not the only one going through it. And a lot of times, like you got to find that in weird places and like Instagram where you don't have a close relationship with people can actually be a place where you can like safely relate to people where you're, you're not able to get that in real life. Well, I love the give and take of the divorce confessions because sometimes people just need to be able to say out loud what they're thinking, what might be taboo. Sometimes they need to hear someone else saying their things so they can relate to them and say, oh my God, yes, yes, that's exactly what I was thinking. And so I, I love this concept of having people share what's on their minds about divorce. Divorce is a dark, heavy topic. And like, yes, you don't want to hear about that all the time because, you know, I love comedy. I love laughing at stuff, laughing at myself. Like divorce is also ridiculous and it's, you know, WTF, it's insane. So I try to inject even into the, like the darkest things, which is tricky sometimes, like a funny gif or meme that can kind of like make you cry, laugh, you know, feel connected. Like I want to really tap into the emotion of it. And a lot of times the emotion is like very nuanced and complicated. Like just because you have a narcissistic ex that, you know, is a terrible person and is ruining your life. Like you got to be able to laugh about it on some level too, just to like feel like a normal person. And while there's incredible content out there, sometimes it, for me personally, it would be, it would be a bit much. So I was like, what if we can take the edge off this and, you know, it really comes down to like normalizing divorce. 50% of people are going through this or married couples. Like, why is this not talked about? Why is the only discussion about it, this heavy, dark stuff? Um, so yeah, just like making it more relatable. It's something that I think is important. What are some of the most typical kinds of topics that people are mentioning? So I know what you do is you ask them to share what's on their mind about divorce. Do you see some patterns or is it like cyclical with the moon, what people decide to talk about? What What's the deal there? Yeah. I mean, they get kind of dark sometimes where I'm like, should I share this? And I'm like, hey, they're anonymous. You know, somebody else. I mean, it's weird. They, even the like, I wish my ex was dead comes through a lot. And it sounds so taboo and terrible, but it's a normal feeling to have. It doesn't mean you're going to go murder this person, but it's right. like, your life is so hard because of this person. And to hear somebody else say it. You get a lot of people raising their hand to that one. Um, dating is a huge topic because, you know, we all think it's going to be like, oh, I'm single now. I'm, I'm on the apps. It's going to be fun. And like the reality of that is very The dark. apps are awful. The apps are awful. But yet they offer an opportunity to meet people that you wouldn't otherwise be able to meet. So it's like this double edged sword. But well, totally necessary. But again, you need to hear people like. You know, and I would almost feel like uh, resentful towards people. Oh, you'll meet somebody. The apps are great. Like you want to hear from people going through it. And a lot of times that is this is brutal. Like every guy or girl sucks out there. So again, like and then using that to, you know, be constructive with it. But also just hearing people that are going through the same struggles you are makes you feel less alone. So dating, co-parenting, like. It really sounds like it should be easier on paper. You hear a lot of people even say like, I think being married to this person was easier than co-parenting with them, which is surprising. And a lot of people say, oh my God, that's what I'm going through too, especially in the beginning. I think your first, you and I went through my first year and I'm very amicable with my ex now. Even hearing like that first year, just right off, it's going to be hellish, you know? So like hearing other people that are in that same struggle and knowing that, you might get out of it, but you also have to like sit in it for a while is helpful. You just have to find your stride that first year with the co-parenting, right? You have to find a routine that works, figure out the drop-offs and all that kind of stuff and and probably work your way through a handful of disagreements so you can kind of get them out of your system, right? Oh, it's so, even like the communication, I mean, because you were probably not communicating well in your marriage and now you have to communicate with them after what could be a contentious divorce. So that could be even like, how do I text better? I'm figuring out what works, what doesn't. It's a lot of trial and error. It's a lot of like uh, failure. I think that's like a lot of co-parenting and divorce is just banging your head against the wall. But 
you need to you need to learn they're like skills that i don't think you do not have just because you're in your 40s or 50s and you're like "Eh, i've lived before i know how to parent i know how to date i'll figure it out it's like you're going into kindergarten again so (laughs) well you um you were kind enough to share with me in advance a handful of the divorce confessions because I just wanted to to go through some of these, share them with the audience and talk about, you know, how often you're seeing comments like these, what are some of the more common things you're hearing? So to start off with one of the ones you shared with me now, reminding our audience that you start off with asking, share what's on your mind about divorce. So you had one that came in that said it will never end going on three years. Is that one you get a lot where people are talking about it's like the divorce is this never ending process, right? Absolutely. I mean, I like you hear how long these are and I almost have like survivor's guilt because mine got wrapped up in a few months pretty tightly. But people going through these things where they're just like bleeding money, they're losing their mind, they're living in the same house with this person. That's a topic like how do I my lawyer told me I shouldn't move out until the divorce is final. It's now two years later. That's a really common thing. And that's another one where I think it helps a little to hear that like other people are going through it, like me too, because, you know, you feel again, like you're the only one dealing with it, but that's a really common thing. And like, I, I feel for those people because that's a rough, it's like this limbo. That's just like this painful place to be just like, get it over with already. And you can't even do that. Well, when you look at some of the online divorce support groups, like on Facebook and things like that. I've been seeing more and more people talking about how they are continuing to live in the same house until the divorce is final. And many times it's for financial reasons uh, that people are having a hard time refinancing mortgages. They're, you know, probably looking at selling the house, but they can't do that until they have a divorce finalized because they're disagreeing about how to go about it. And so, yeah, the idea of you know, understand that there are actually quite a few people who are going through that cohabitation situation or that dragging on situation is probably pretty helpful. Now, that one, I don't think, you know, complaining about how long the divorce is taking, I don't think is so scandalous. But here's one of your divorce confessions that came through that some people might think is a little more scandalous. I feel weird about how much I enjoy my days without the kids sometimes. Did I write that one? That might have been me. I don't know. I mean, you get that. Oh, heavens. uh, You get that a lot. And I feel that every day. I think like that. You're almost two different people when you're with the kids, especially for men who are not probably used to. I've got three little kids running around. That is a lot. Um, Even if your marriage wasn't good, you did have some kind of, well, I can't speak for everybody, but like usually there were two people helping out. So I think that's a really common thing. Schedules like you're on for a week and then all of a sudden you're like a free agent adult walking around. For me personally, I always say it takes me like 36 hours to like decompress, go from Superman to Clark Kent or whatever it is. Um, really common thing. And I think like, uh, you hear a lot of women, especially that like, you know, they're the primary caretaker. And if their ex gets one weekend a month, which they might not even like their ex, it's like, God, you know, people need that because so much falls on you. And that's a really important thing to hear other people going through. You know, married moms will say, oh, I'd do anything for like a weekend away. But it's just it's different. It's more complicated when maybe you don't even trust your your ex, you know, parenting with the kids. So like there's a lot of just like complication there. But again, like we are human beings. We're adults. We need our own space. We need time to decompress. And that can be a tricky thing during divorce. Yeah, I absolutely endorse the concept of you do need time away from your kids. And so if you're that primary parent and you have your kids, say, 70% of the time, don't feel guilty that some of that time you're thinking, gosh, I just need a break for my kids. It's completely normal. Right. Or do feel guilty. You know, it's like that's the thing, too. It's like these feelings are natural, but also know that that's normal, that that's okay, that I'm given a lot more screen time than maybe we used to back. Here's an iPad. Here's a phone. Daddy needs to go for a walk. All of those things are normal. Everybody is going through it. And you have like guilt too as a divorced parent. Like I'm putting my kids through this. Like they don't need to be shipping 
you know, back and forth. Even right after this, I've got to go bring a, a blanket over to their mom's house that they forgot. So there's all these little like, uh, complications that are frustrating and you take that on, you want to make everything right, but you can completely lose yourself doing it. And I think that's like the bane of a lot of co-parents existence. Well, and I'm sitting here saying, don't feel guilty for that, but actually feel your feels. If you need, you know, if there's some guilt that goes along with wanting a little bit of space from your kids, feel that feeling and then move past it, right? We're, yeah. We don't have to suppress feeling good or bad about whatever we're going through. Absolutely. Okay. Here's another one. I hate that I miss him so much. Yeah, that's a big one. I mean, you get most people say, I can't stand him. I'm, but it's complicated too. I mean, a lot of it is, what do they say? You're grieving the loss of what could have been. You're yes. grieving companionship, connection. Like, like you get used to that. That's a, like, I don't, human beings are not really meant to be alone. Even this concept of like, oh, be single for a while. Most of those people are, end up in relationships that are saying it. So I think it's just like, it's not a natural thing. A lot of people have been married or with this person for 20, 30 years. So they're not used to being alone. So I think it's helpful for people to see that like, you can miss parts of them. That's the other piece. Uh, I've experienced this where you start to kind of romanticize like, oh, we had so much fun. We did this. You don't really think about the bad stuff as much. So it's a normal feeling to miss them on some level and Again, it can be isolating because your friends and family, thank God you're rid of them. You're living the dream now. And that like there is conflict between, well, I don't really feel like that. So important to see that other people have these like mixed feelings as well. I don't have any hard stats to go along with this, but I know that there is a fair instance of people separating and then coming back together and separating again and coming back together. And that there may be one or two reconciliations throughout the divorce process. And I think it's exactly that is you romanticize the good times, you miss them, you miss the companionship. Okay, let's get together and give it another try. And then you get back together and see all the reasons why you're just not good together. Finding it hard to get past the total contempt for my ex. Oh goodness, those feelings of rage, anger, hate, and just all around contempt for your ex. Yeah, uh, very common. I mean, again, if you have a contentious divorce or contentious relationship, any little thing can trigger you. We just posted something today where like a thumbs up on a text message can drive you crazy. I've experienced that. Like, oh, what the hell are they thinking? Oh, they're so cocky. They got everything figured out, right? Uh, a very normal to just like we're emotional creatures, right? And like we're now having these dialogues about our kids or about things. It's just like a, it's a very weird place to be in. And it's very normal to just like be enraged. Like you've got cortisol, you can get a text message. You got cortisol now flowing through you, um, that like you don't know how to deal with. And like that turns into you telling a story in your head and just having you know, that rage is like a, and that's a tough thing to carry around too. So that, that can be hard too. I don't want to be mad all the time but uh yeah just normal thing that people are going through again like just realize that that's that's part of it okay here's a dating confession i'm spotting red flags quicker this time around during dating i always wonder if people are like extra paranoid once they get back into the dating realm and is everything a red flag i i see this in the divorce support groups online anything anyone says oh red flag red flag drop him immediately it's like hang on a second we're all just trying to learn how to do this dating thing again yeah well you dated probably i'm dated most people since their 20s when you didn't know anything anyways when you were fueled by passion you were like oh, i want to have kids with this person now you're like out in the wild again and i was just talking to a friend about this like i consume a lot i didn't know anything about relationships and boundaries and dating and feelings like this before I, you know, you're married. What are you thinking about that stuff for? Now there's so much content out there that mind you is very helpful, but I think in a lot of ways it like makes dating more complicated. Sometimes I'm like, is, is ignorance bliss? Like I'm, how am I ever going to find somebody if I see that they're uh, avoidant or they're inconsistent or they, you know, like, I think there is a piece where you do have to get to a point where you've got to say, this bothers me, but it's not a deal breaker. 
or you're going out on so many bad dates that you finally meet somebody that's pretty good. Do I stick, do I stick with this person or are they out too? So it's, it's very tricky. And I think our guards are up when we're dating. So you're, you're on the lookout. You're, you, you should be on the lookout for everything, but finding that like balance of like, you know, this isn't my favorite thing, but I like this person and I'm going to give it a shot is it's tricky. I think dating coaches can be super helpful to people in this situation because like you said, they haven't dated for so long. It's changed, et cetera. Um, being that I investigate fraud, I'm certainly a proponent of looking out for red flags. But when it comes to dating, it's like, okay, I feel like you should sort of have your list of non-negotiables and the stuff that is not on that list that you might think is a red flag, like just give it a minute and then see see what's happening. And maybe, you know, oh, he didn't text me back right away. Well, maybe he's feeling awkward. Like just give it a chance, right? Oh, I think that's the one thing. It's very hard because now we're in a lot of these marriages, you stop communicating with your person. So you just kind of, you both go off on your own, you're resentful. So you kind of carry that into your dating thing. You expect this other person to know how you like to communicate. And that's the one thing I'm, I still struggle with and I'm still always trying to like re remind myself, like you need to almost over communicate these things. This person doesn't know that you don't really like texting all day during work. And now at the end of the day, you're like, I can't stand this person. You've got to have these got to have uncomfortable conversations that you probably right. weren't having in your marriage. And that's, that's awkward and uncomfortable to do. All right. One more to wrap us up today. I hate that I have to have anything to do with my ex. Co-parenting with a narcissist is hard. Yeah. I feel for a lot of people that are dealing with like, you know, it sounds like there are a lot of extremely toxic partners and you know, like that is extremely isolating to drive you absolutely crazy. I think what I found is like finding these tools like uh, our family wizard and like finding ways yes. to communicate better are really important because, you know, you're now dealing with this person who you do. You want your kids to have a relationship with. It's, it's very complicated and it can be like, how is this? How is this supposed to work? How is this easier? And again, you can consume a lot of content on Instagram that makes you feel like just breathe and it's going to be okay. And you try that a few times and when it doesn't work, you're like, I'm, this is just different. This person is the worst. And I think there's a lot of people that are out there that have that contempt, you know, maybe it's most of the time, but I always say like, if you have complete, you know, we always think we're not supposed to be like completely better or we're the same as we were. If you can be 20% less contempt than you were, you know, the first few months of this, then that's an improvement. Or if you're able to handle it, you have to recognize that like any growth is growth and you're not just going to be like, oh, nothing bothers me anymore. You're still going to, you're still going to get pissed. That's, that's just part of the, the process. It's hard. You probably went through a lot in your marriage. You probably went through a lot in the divorce and now you should be fostering a relationship with your co-parent, right? Even if they were horrible to you, um, it's probably still, in most cases, the best thing for the kids to have a relationship with them. And, and to be put in a position where you have to foster that is probably sometimes a bitter pill to swallow, but it's one of those things that comes along with divorce. Well, and one thing, and anybody listening to this is like, they're following you, they're following WTF divorce, they're learning, they want to get better. A lot of times that other person, man or woman, they never, they don't even think to listen to a podcast. They're just like, ah, this person sucks. So you, it's frustrating when you're like, I want this to be easier for us. The other person really has no interest in that. And that can be challenging when you're like, but I want it to work better. And like, you cannot control that other person and what they do. So that, that takes some time getting used to also. Rob, I have really enjoyed this conversation today. I think you bring so much to the divorce space, and I am so happy to have you as a colleague out there supporting men and women going through divorce. How can people find you? Thank you, Tracy. Uh, if you'd have told me like three years ago I would have a divorce company podcast, I would never have believed you. This is this is wild. Uh, I am on Instagram at WTF Divorce, WTFDivorce.com. We've got a lot of uh, great content and a lot of professionals that can help people with the exact problem that they're going through, financial, mortgages, co-parenting, uh, podcast, w WTF Divorce, anywhere you look. We try to keep the name memorable and fun and 
uh, yeah, send me a DM there. I love connecting with uh, people in our audience. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time today. Thanks, Tracy.